Philippians chapter 1. And I've never been able to dance. But it's nice just to jump around. You know, when you have the joy of the Lord, you just jump around. And, uh, well, you know, today is the, um, marks the 15th anniversary of the terrorist attack on 9-11, uh, 2001. So I'd like to share um, just some thoughts on that as we, as we begin the sermon this morning. Um, you know, we need to remember uh, this first poem that I'm about to read uh, it was from a seventh grader uh, named Hannah. And uh, it's amazing how uh, each one of us uh, are affected by what happened on that day. And it always, you know, doesn't surprise me, but I like to hear the hearts of our young people and, uh, and how they were uh, moved by this incident. And uh, I just want you to hear the patriotism, you know, behind uh, this, this first poem. And then uh, we'll pray for our country. Those twin towers stand tall with pride. Fell with grieving hearts, stunned America cried. But we're still standing. Bin Laden tried to crush our land, but we stood our ground with flag in hand. We're still standing. Red for valor and the blood that fell. White for purity, those heroes tell. Blue for justice that will be done, proving once more these colors don't run. We're still standing. The 11th of September. We mourn their loss this day, this year. Those now with God, no danger near. So many loved ones left do stand, comforting loss throughout the land. My heart goes out to those who do. No one can fathom what they view. I firmly pray for peace of mind. Dear God, please help each one to find. And to our soldiers now at war, God guide above, at sea, at shore. They are the best, I have no doubt. Our country's pride complete devout. The finest force you'll ever see. All freedom grown through liberty. One final thought comes clear to me. For what must live in infamy, absolutely will remember the 11th of September. And Father, so we pause. And Father, to your ears we pray only through the Lord Jesus Christ, the only hope of humanity. And Father, with Paul saying, you're the God of all mercy and the God of all grace. You comfort those, Father, in any affliction. And certainly, a great affliction has fell upon many families. And Father, they'll grieve always. That hole will never be filled. Father, the only hope we have is the resurrection, but not all have embraced the truth. So, Father, we pray your blessing upon this land. Father, where we've turned our face, may we turn back. Father, be with uh, each family, Lord, that has a loss. Let us never forget, let us remember this day. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. John Ashcroft said this. We learned on September the 11th, is that the unthinkable is now thinkable in the world. And as I thought about that, and I thought about the Apostle Paul being in prison, although it is the opposite end of the the spectrum, Paul had to go through the unthinkable to get to a place where he could share the gospel. He probably never thought that he would be in prison for the gospel's sake. So with that in mind, let's read Father down through or let's read down through verse 12 and 14. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Imagine that. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. 
and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. And so if God could advance the gospel when Paul lost his freedom and was in prison, can he use the church today as we are free to, to advance the gospel? And I think we would all say yes. Yes? And, uh, but that depends on our attitude towards the gospel. That depends on how focused we are. And I believe as we go through this message, we'll see just how focused the apostle Paul was and how he handled the situation the way that he did, with joy in his heart even, as he would rejoice over and over again. But when Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, Jesus' reply was this. Upon this rock, he said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And so here, Paul, he still believes that God is building his church, although he himself is incarcerated there with a guard right chained to his very own wrist. Paul knew that God was working, obviously wanted the gospel to be in Rome at that time. So even to the point where it was in Nero's own house, the emperor at that time. And so the progress of the gospel advanced because, number one, the progress of the gospel was all that mattered to the apostle Paul. It just consumed him. And I believe it's the same transformation that God's looking for today in his people. That nothing else matters except for the advancement of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. When Paul says, now I want you to know, as he starts verse 12, what he's saying here is under these circumstances, God had a better plan. You see, Paul, as he would preach the gospel, would end up in prison in Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, for two years. Then another two years here in Rome. And I don't think he ever expected to have to preach the gospel that way, but that was the situation he was put in. But you would think that that would shut the gospel down, but, in, but, but the very opposite happened. It expanded the gospel right there in Paul, saying that it turned out for the progress of the gospel. You would expect, if you were free and then you were in prison, that all bets would be off, everything would stop, and the church would not progress, at least under the apostle Paul. But not for Paul. You see, nothing mattered to him. The progress of the gospel was everything. And so we can ask the question ourselves, what's our passion for living? What drives us each morning as we get up? The first thing you might think is your job. But on your job, there's opportunity. On your job, there's people. On your job, there's lost souls. What takes up our energy? What dominates our time? What dominates our thinking? What dominates our reading and our watching? What makes our life tick? What passion do we carry in our heart? I believe these are questions we have to ask as we view the life of the Apostle Paul because nothing mattered to him except for the advancement of the gospel. You see, it was a little of consequence to Paul what happened to his life. He had a career. He trained for it his whole life through his parents, was sent off to Jerusalem, for education. He was educated also as a Greek. So he really, it, didn't, it wasn't about his circumstances. Here's what he says in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Listen to this. He says, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. Now that's surrender, isn't it? So that I may finish my course, the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify earnestly of the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, Paul said, I don't want to do anything else. This is all I want to do. So maybe that's why he was shocked when he was in prison and couldn't get out. But he also says this in Romans 1.15, I'm eager to preach the gospel also to those in Rome. See, he wanted to go there. He just didn't go the way he expected to go. He says in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Greek or the Gentile. And then he says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. See, Paul was driven, wasn't he? He was driven by the progress of the gospel. Nothing else mattered to him. And you know, when we're baptizing, when we're studying with people for salvation, when people fill out the visitor's card and say, we're interested in being a member, 
and we're interested in being baptized, nothing else matters in the ministry. And yes, there's those things that keeps the building going and keeps the programs going. There's meetings all the time. There's uh, things, that, programs that we're working on a whole year for, of calendar we work on each year and everything. But nothing else matters than salvation of people's soul. And that's how it was for the Apostle Paul. It said that there was great progress even though he was in prison. Now this word progress, when you look it up in the Greek language there and look up the definition... Uh, Prokopi is the word. It's not just a word that means progress in the sense of something moving along. Inherent in the word is the idea that it's moving along despite obstacle, danger, and distraction. It's inherent in the very word is this idea of resistance. Now, how many Trekkies we have today? I know a lot of our women are gone, and I know a lot of them are Trekkies. How many Trekkies we have? And, you know, when I, see that, when I hear that word resistance, what's the first thing you think of when you think of the Borg? The Borg. Anybody? Yeah, resistance is futile. And uh, many voices say that at the same time. And that's, and that's how the gospel moves along. Resistance. There was always resistance. And Paul had great resistance, didn't he? Because he found himself in prison. But so this word here, uh, the, the uh, literal form of it, the verb form, is this idea of cutting down in advance. And so here was the idea. You would have a group of men who would go out and they would cut down trees and underbrush and made a way for the armies to come before. You see, they had to move so they could advance. They had to remove things, but it still advanced as, they remo- as the army would follow. And so Paul says the gospel is advancing against obstacles, his imprisonment, the Roman government. But the word still moved on. It still advanced under those circumstances. Four different times in this chapter alone, Paul talks about the gospel. He also says that there's an energy behind it in some of these verses. Verse 14 said, uh, talking about the gospel and advancement, far more, there are people who have far more courage to speak the gospel because of Paul's imprisonment. In verse 22, it says, for Paul to remain, if he said, if I remain here, and uh, I don't move on to be with the Lord. There was fruitful labor to advance the word. In verse 27, he exhorted the church to strive together for the faith of the gospel. You see, all souls matter to God. Even the ones chained to the apostle Paul, you know, they had the greatest opportunity for the gospel because they were chained to the apostle Paul. And so Paul labored for the message of salvation. You know, all last week, as I knew 9-11 was approaching, uh, I decided to, you know, go online. And, um, you know, I have this amazing a tablet now. And uh, you can look up anything, can't you? And uh, so I looked up the 9-11 stuff. And um, there were over 100 camera views of Flight 175 going into that Second World Trade Center. And uh, I watched 43 of them. And, uh, you know, every one of them devastating each one. Uh, you know, different angles. And then, but the, what was really amazing about it, which was really sad about it, is the reaction of the people filming at the moment. Because some of them, you know, were, were private cameras and everything. And um, everybody was just filming the first one smoking, World Trade Center 1, and had no idea what was about to happen. So on September 11, 2001, at 9.03 a.m., United Flight 175 with 68 passengers on board 10,000 gallons of jet fuel was on board. The plane was traveling 590 miles per hour. As it slammed into that south tower of the World Trade Center 2, it hit between floors 77 and 85. It immediately pulverized those floors and incinerated 637 souls. So in an instant, 637 souls were either home with God are separated from God. And so it is imperative, isn't it? That we would imitate Paul as he imitated Christ. And nothing else mattered to him except for the progress of the gospel. He said it progressed even though he was in the chains. You see, it doesn't matter how we perish, young or old, or in a terrorist attack. Our relationship with, with the Lord is everything. So not only were Bible, uh, by, bodies incinerated that day, not only 3,000 people died on that day, but what happened to the soul? 
And that's our responsibility as Christians and as the church. And so what passion do we live for today? What drives us? What takes up our time? Well, it was clear what took up Paul's time, wasn't it? Number two, no matter the circumstance Christ was proclaimed, look at these verses following. Verse 15, some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, Paul says, I rejoice. And yes, he said, I will rejoice. When Paul talks about his imprisonment, he tells us it's because of Christ, the cause of Christ. He always saw himself as a prisoner because of Jesus. He wasn't a prisoner, he committed a crime. He committed no crime. He was a prisoner because he preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He represented him. In Philemon 9 and 13, it says these verses. He is a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and that he is a prisoner for the gospel. And so it became well known why Paul was in prison. It wasn't for a crime, because he simply preached Jesus Christ from his heart. You see, this opened the door, I believe, to intrigue and curiosity from those who were around the Apostle Paul, especially the guards. You know, the Bible tells us, Paul tells us in 1 Timothy, we're to pray for governing authorities. And the reason why we pray is so that there's tranquility in society, that government would do their job so that with peace the, 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 the church can prosper. But wouldn't it be nice if they were converted? In that prayer, do you think, man, wouldn't it be nice if... D.C., Washington, D.C., that they could repent and turn back to God. They can look at their families and father and say, well, they were success. How, do we, how were we successful up until this time in our history? Well, it's because we feared God. Maybe that's what it was. We need to go back. We need to repent of the life we're living now and the policies we make today. Wouldn't it be good if we, we would be able to convert them? Maybe that should be our prayer along with the tranquility and praying for governing authorities. But this is exactly what happened to Rome in that day. God took Paul and put him right in the center of the action, so to speak. There was no possible way Paul, with all his planning and even his desire, and God knew his heart to go to Rome, that he could have pulled this off. He wouldn't have got anywhere near the elite guard of the Romans. But imagine this. They were chained to a man who was well-traveled. To a man who was well-educated and learned. The guards would witness a man so physically broken, yet he rejoiced in his life. What a witness that had to have been on those men. His, educated exceeded, his education exceeded their own. He spoke several languages, their language, the Hebrew language. And Paul, by this time, would be so well-seasoned to be a counselor if they came with problems. And, of course, they would pass this along. And Paul said this, all things, I become all things to all men that I may win some. So Paul was well seasoned for this moment to interact with these men. They would witness the sweet fellowship of conversion right there in the midst of that prison, his prison house, which was, which was rented. He would, they would also see the struggle for the gospel as well. The first Jews who came in, they didn't accept Paul's babbling. They didn't accept it. They had to go home and, and look at it again. And they said they would come back at an appointed time. In Acts chapter 28, it tells us that why Paul was in prison, here's what was happening. Paul was unhindered with all openness to preach the kingdom of God and the teachings concerning the Lord Jesus. You see, it was apparent that they not only penetrated the, the guard that was with uh, Paul, but also the very household of the emperor himself. It tells us in verse 22 of Philippians 4, Paul ends his letter by saying this, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. And so Paul's circumstance did turn out to be well known. It says there that everybody, 
knew, not just the guard. And here's one of the reasons why. The Praetorian Guard uh, under the emperor <clears throat> had grown to close to 16,000 by this time. And so there, as their numbers grew, uh, they were to protect the emperor. It was necessary that these would be the elite and they would be the only ones permitted to serve under this office. They became powerfully influential in the central government of the Rome, Rome over time. When they retired, they became government officials. Their power had grown so much by this time that they had an influence on who the next emperor would be, but also the duration of that emperor's role. And Nero at this time is a perfect example of this, because here's what happened. There was a public outrage because of his policies. So therefore, also the Praetorian Guard at this time put pressure on him. He was only in office for 13 years, and the pressure became so difficult that he committed suicide. And that pressure had to come from within. And so history says they believe it's from this guard. You couldn't have converted a more influential group of Romans at that time that Paul had audience with. Paul's influence and his popularity soared because of his unhindered visitors and also the people in which God put before him to preach the gospel. Paul's imprisonment because of Christ became well-known, it says. Well-known throughout the city of Rome. Verse 14, though, says that some were so encouraged that they preached without fear because of what happened to the apostle Paul. And maybe part of it was that the guards now say, we're not, we're not going to hinder this movement ourselves. We believe it. And that was probably going on as well, but they were able to do that. Verse 15 through 18, some preached the gospel out of envy. Some were saying, okay, Paul's out of the picture. We'll start our own churches. And so uh, that's probably what happened. They preached out of envy. Um, Paul kept the focus on his position that God put him in. He was able to rejoice. He was able to you know, point out that it was just self-serving for themselves, those who opposed him in that way. You see, their movement was wrong. Maybe their doctrine was right. They preach Christ. That's why Paul says, I can rejoice even though uh, they, they do it with wrong motives. And he said, the motive is always love when you preach the gospel. And so, even if strange doctrine is taught along with Jesus, there's still a foundation to bring souls closer to, to God and the truth. And so, Apollos is one of those there in Acts says they taught him the way of the Lord, Aquila and Priscilla, the way of the Lord more perfectly. And Paul runs into 12 men at Ephesus, the same thing. They only knew the baptism of John like Apollos, and he enlightened them, and they became obedient. So let me ask this, how many of us here were first taught Jesus, but were not taught the biblical way to be saved in Jesus? Raise your hand. It's probably many of us. That was my story as well. I knew about Jesus as a young man, I knew that he was the son of God. I knew he died for my sins. It wasn't personal. But I really wasn't taught the doctrine of salvation according to the scriptures that he poured into the the apostles and which happened on the day of Pentecost. And so we can rejoice when the gospel is simply proclaimed. But we do have the responsibility of correcting when we run into folks who are not enlightened by the scriptures. Now look, each year... uh, I haven't done it in a few years for different reasons, physical reasons. But uh, how many have ever been to the March for Life down in Washington? How many have been there? You, you need to experience that at least once in your life. It's it just amazing, isn't it, Mom, Chuck? Just an amazing place to go. There's so many people there and uh, thousands of people. Um, how many went to the, um, is Cynthia here? No, she's at the laser tree. A lot of ladies are there. Um, the... Um, Tea Party movement up in Washington, D.C. You go to that, there's a million people there. You know, when they brag about, you know, the million men marching, there wasn't a million men there, but there was a million people there for that, for that gathering. Now, in, in both of those instances, especially the March for Life, there's a lot of people who believe in Jesus. There's a lot of people who are willing to stand you know, against abortion because they're deep convictions of what they know about Jesus. But that doesn't mean that they still have the gospel which was preached by Jesus correctly. And so we can rejoice that his name is being spread and people are believing it, but also we have to make sure that we 
filter that down to the truth, don't we? So I can understand why Paul could rejoice in those people preaching even out of envy and strife and jealousy even towards him. And number three, in freedom or imprisonment, there will be the joy of deliverance. Uh, Follow with me starting with verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and provision of the whole of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectations and hope, I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether in life or death. That's a really important verse right there, because first we're saying, well, if he's put to, if he's put to death by by Nero, then wouldn't he be ashamed? Or if, you know, he lives on and uh, they never let him out of a prison, wouldn't he be ashamed? But he said whether in life or death, both deliverances will glorify God, won't they? And he'll go on to say it like this, for to me is to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I'm to live on in the flesh I will meet, it will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both sides, having desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you, with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. You see, Paul had a win-win situation. The devil could not win in the situation. God is glorified in both circumstances. Paul will be delivered either out of prison, that's a blessing, or he'll be with the Lord. So it's a win-win scenario. He would not have no Christians ashamed of death because we'll be with Christ, won't we? See, the threat of death is not a threat to us, is it? And it wasn't to Paul. You see, Paul existed in his body. He wanted to exalt God in his body, whether in life or in death. Even in prison, there's only one thing that mattered to Paul, and that was the progress of the gospel. And so Paul says, to live is gain. To die is to be with you. And here's the amazing thing. How many are anticipating the coming of Christ? Raise your hand if you want him to come back. Matter of fact, he'd come back today, I'd be happy, wouldn't you? Because it's a mess down here, isn't it? It's an absolute mess. And even John, when he wrote the word, said, Come, Lord Jesus, come, even in that moment. Come on back. But by God's grace, he's allowed many souls to enter the kingdom over these 2,000 years. And so as, as, Christ, as God holds back uh, the, the judgment of this world, souls are still one. But that depends on how we feel about the gospel. For Paul, it was everything. The advancement and the progress of the gospel was everything to him. That's all that mattered. But this is an amazing thing. He could have prayed to go home. Now look, we could pray to go home too. But we're not in Paul's situation, are we? I mean, his body's mangled. He's in prison. He's in chains. He has no private life at all. He doesn't have a wife to leave behind. You know, so I can say, all right, Lord, take me home today. But see, our request is the second coming of Christ, isn't it? Because here's in the final analysis, here's what Paul's saying. Yeah, I could go home. He even says, that would be much better. Amen? That would be much better. You see, but sometimes we, we are so ingrained, we are so attached. We are so caught up in now, the moment, the, you know, and, 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 I, and it's, it just popped in my brain, but it's in your brain too, NFL's so going next. You see, there's a lot of things that stimulate us, a lot of things we're into, and uh, there's little infant babies around here, and boy, boy, what a, what a, what a, it's a, what a great life to, to raise children, you know. But still, there's a greater cause, isn't there? It's the progress of the gospel, the kingdom of God. But here's what Paul basically is saying. I could go home. That would be much better. 
But he says here, it's better, it's necessary in verse 24, for your sake that I stay. So it really comes down to this. Um, To stay is for God. It's for Christ. It's for the kingdom. To leave is much better. And look, there's many reasons why we want this to end. Because of sin, frustration, scars, hurt, pain in our own personal lives. But we're not in Paul's situation. He said, no, I'm not giving up. It's hard. I'm in prison. I have no private life. Uh, I'm, I'm made fun of by some of them. And Nero is so angry. And I know he's going to probably eventually take my head. But there's something greater. The prosperity of the gospel. And so to live is gain. Can we walk out of here today with that in our heart? To live is gain for us, for the lost, for our neighbors. John Andrews, thank you for being here. It's not an easy thing to do. Your body's fighting against you. But he got up today and he's in church. Could have stayed home. Right? Paul's body was mangled. He got up every day. Preach the gospel to whoever God brought to his path. We're free. Every day you meet, how many people just in this room are met? Strangers meet strangers. Opportunities that God gives us. So Paul had joy in either deliverance. That word deliverance in your Bible means salvation. He could have been saved. Uh, and back out on the uh, preaching trail and planting churches, and that would have been a rescue and deliverance from prison, or he could have went home to be with Jesus. And uh, the band can make their way out. I know they didn't want me to say that, but that's, uh, I gave them their cue, and they're making their way up. If you turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, I want to read a couple of verses as we go to our communion time. If the men want to go ahead and, and um, get themselves ready for communion. Appreciate that. Um, Sixteen times Paul talks about the joy of the gospel and how he rejoices that Christ is proclaimed. And um, I'm going to read some words about Jesus here that goes along with the same idea. As we think about 9-11, the idea between by the poems and the songs that are written and the celebrations and the mourning of loss and the ongoing uh, trial. And then there's a bill right now where they're trying to uh, sue the Saudis, you know, for those families that that died on that day. And uh, as time goes on, uh, remembering is so important, isn't it? And it was so important to Jesus that we remember because if we don't remember, evil will attack again. And if we don't remember that Jesus died for our sins, sin will overtake us, whether it be on a personal level or on the level of a family, country, altogether. So that's why we commune at this time to remember that we're died for and loved by God, that Jesus really put his life on the line. Here's how he saw his crucifixion. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The next verse says, consider him. And so as we remember, we're remembering that he endured that pain, humility for our behalf. That as we eat the bread, it reminds us that he did come in the flesh, God in the flesh, the incarnate God, the Son of God, and he did not sin. He became the perfect, unblemished, acceptable sacrifice to the Father to forgive sins for all time, for all generations, even to this very day until he returns. So that's what we remember. That blood, more precious than silver and gold. As a matter of fact, what we remember right now is the only solution to the problem of the evil and darkness in our world that we suffer through right now. 
That's our hope, the resurrection, the salvation Jesus offers. Father, as we break the bread and drink the cup, we're reminded that Jesus said the joy set before him, he endured the cross for us today, for all who are saved. And Father, so the joy that we have is the joy of our salvation because of what Jesus did. But also, Father, we have the same joy as the Apostle Paul when the gospel progresses. And so, Father, thank you for the joy of Jesus. Thank you for this communion time. Father, we pray your blessing upon it, and we pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ.